Hi, Jeff Disher here again today. Uh, I'm going to talk about a issue which I think is really interesting. It's one of the ones that I was really fascinated by when I was in university. And even before that, I was really into. Uh, so without further ado, let's dive into CPU architecture. So first of all, the CPU, how CPU actually works, just really quick rundown, is instructions are stored as just a, a bunch of numbers in memory. These are interpreted directly by the CPU, and so they're specific to the CPU architecture. On one of them, the number 5 might mean add, on another one it might mean load, or something like that. This is what makes a, a program which is written for, or compiled for, say, a PowerPC, not be something you can run on, like, an Intel processor, and vice versa. They're actually just different fundamental languages, which are specific to each of the chips. So the basic operation that you've got with how CPU works is it reads the instructions from memory, it decodes it, or uh, there's other phases called crack or crunch, which are sometimes applied in modern CPUs to break them down to simpler ideas, and then the instruction is executed, the result is written back to, uh, to memory or up to the registers on the CPU, and then it advances to the next instruction. Sometimes that might not be the next instruction, it might be somewhere else, but it's what's called a branch. Basically, the, prob the fundamental problem of CPU architecture and what the problem is, what we're trying to solve is, par hardware is a parallel thing. Uh, you can always add more transistors to do more things in parallel, but software is actually written sequentially. It says do one thing, then do another. So the fundamental problem is how do we use parallel hardware to run sequential software faster? And this is something there's been many different approaches to, and they've evolved over time. So CISC is one of the most fundamental, sort of the basic starting point of how we started using semiconductors, all the way back to the beginning. Nowadays we refer to this as CISC, Complex Instruction Set Computing. Now this basically means encode the, the intention of the instruction directly and have the CPU just execute it. This worked really well a long time ago. You'd have a very simple thing like add X and Y and put the result into Z. An instruction like this can actually be written on a modern x86 processor, for example. And this, these are all from to and from memory addresses, so it tells the CPU, do this complicated thing. That's why it's complex. It's that each instruction can say, do several different things that are all together make up one logical operation. The problem with this is that some instructions take more time than others. So for example, loading from memory can take a really long time. Adding two numbers together can be really fast. Dividing two numbers might take longer, so somewhere in between these two. So this is what causes a lot of the problems that we were seeing with the original implementations of Cisco architectures. They couldn't encode this cost in such a way that the compiler that you're using to write the, the change your C program or whatever into binary for the processor uh, it couldn't take advantage of that, and it couldn't work around that in high-level ways, which is an opportunity that was really lost there. Examples of this are the x86 architecture, which is used by most computers today, um, and they've, they've adapted their internal implementation, so even though it looks CISC on the outside internally, it actually does something a bit more risk-like. Uh, the S390 is another one which used this before, and still exists today. It's used in mainframes. So risk was something which was result which we came up with to try and get around that limitation. So it's called reduced instruction set compute. It doesn't mean that there's a reduced number of instructions. In fact, risk instruction sets are usually very large. It's just that it means each instruction does a reduced amount of work. They're much, much simpler. So it says, all right, break down a complex operation into really simple sub-operations. And that way we can run those in really quick succession. So we can clock up the processor much faster and make it do things in smaller pieces that overall end up having a faster instruction stream. So the example of that, the past example put in risk terms would mean, okay, load X, load Y, add X and Y, and then store the result into Z. This would be four instructions on a risk processor. Uh, on something like a power PC, this is exactly what you'd see. The problem with this is there's no description of instruction level parallelism. And this is because over time, as uh, CPUs got faster and faster, different instructions started taking different amounts of time, memory became further away and slower compared to the CPU, so memory operations became really slow and became a bottleneck all of a sudden. But we also started realizing, well, you could actually fundamentally do a bunch of these instructions in parallel. So the RISC chip started having to figure this out as they were going along, so they could execute them at the same time. This is what was called superscalar. Uh, it's applied in all modern processors. So an example of this is uh, the ARM architecture, which is used um, basically in most, pretty much all smartphones and tablets, they use the ARM architecture. Uh, PowerPC is another one, which is fairly common, used to be used by Apple uh, about uh, 10 years ago. Uh, 
or eight years ago, I guess. And uh, so those, those work very purely in this sense. So to get around that problem of we can't describe what we can do in parallel uh, to, the, to the chip, so the chip is wasting transistors trying to figure that out, and wasting power trying to figure that out, wouldn't it be great if the compiler that's already writing the program for us, already creating the binary, it already knows what we meant because we gave it the C program, which is a higher level description of what we're trying to do. So it actually has some idea of what you could do in parallel. So that's where we came up with VLIW. VLIW is very long instruction. What this basically means is you bundle together independent operations, which you promise can be executed in parallel. So now the compiler can tell the CPU, yeah, you can do these two or three instructions at the same time. I can prove that's okay. So the chip no longer needs to figure that out. And it also doesn't need to do any checks to make sure there's no interdependency. The compiler already told it, I promise these can be done this way. So it makes the chips it means more of the transistors you've got can actually be spent doing useful work instead of just trying to figure out what useful work is. It also means they use less power. So the example of this would be, from, from before, we can take these four risk instructions and group them into VLIW bundles or groups. Uh, so here we have three groups. We have load X, load Y. We say those can be executed at the same time because they're unrelated. And then add X and Y. Okay, that has to be its own group because it depends on the loads finishing. And then store Z, that's its own group as well, because it has to rely on the add having completed. So this exposes that instruction level parallelism possibility and capability of the chip to the compiler so it can come up with these more optimized sequences that actually execute faster. The problem with doing this in the original implementations uh, was that it meant that the software was very specific to that version or variant of the processor. So if your processor could execute two things at once, then the group would be two instructions long. If your next version could do three at once, well, now you have to recompile all your software. So in certain limited environments, as specific microcontrollers and things like that, this was fine because you didn't change, you didn't, whenever you came up with a new version of the hardware, you could just recompile all the software and be fine. But for general purpose things, like, oh, I want to download a program from the internet and run it, well, you couldn't do that unless you got the one for the right version, so it wouldn't really work in that example. The only one of these that actually made it into kind of mainstream use was the Transmeta Crusoe. Uh, what it did was it was actually, it had a piece of software that was an x86 code morpher, they called it. So it would run x86 instructions like, a, like for an Intel CPU. But what it would do is internally it had a program which changed them into VLIW instruction groups. And uh, this was primarily used about 10 years ago in a lot of kind of low power uh, consumer laptops and they'd run Windows or Linux or whatever on them because to the operating system they look like an x86. Um, because of the cost of that program that's doing the cross compiling, the code morphing, lives in memory, this meant you had more memory access. So it was one of the things that really slowed it down over time and uh, you tend not to see these very often anymore. So to solve that problem of how do you take software and move it from one version of a VLIW to the next, we came up with what's called EPIC or instruction, explicitly parallel instruction computing. This was based on the idea that you could take bundles of instructions and say, okay, well, we're always going to say there's a certain, we're always going to be able to execute a multiple of a certain number of instructions at once. So we'll make that the bundle size. Um, but then we're also going to say that each bundle will have a little piece of data on it, often called a stop bit which says whether or not it's the end of a group of bundles. So this way you could have, say your processor executes three instructions per cycle, uh, like with the basis of an itanium, um, and then all right, your first version, say, only executes three. Well, then the next version could execute six, we'll say. All right, well, that means if you have well-optimized well software from your compiler, the same program, the same binary that ran on version one, will now run on version two, except it'll just run twice as fast for the same clock. So this was a really novel idea and really quite clever. Um, the example, I can't come up with a good example because the example I'm using here to make it simple enough to, to kind of talk through, it would look the same for VLIW and for EPIC. You need to be doing a lot of things that the compiler can think about at the same time uh, and it can realize are mutually uh, independent operations such that we could have a useful example. So they're more complicated to come up with, but fundamentally it's the same idea as VLIW. So the example that we have of this in terms of what's actually out in the market is Intel's Itanium processor. Um, as I understand it, all implementations they have 
execute six instructions at a time. Their bundle size is three instructions. Um, and But it means that in the future, if they came up with one that did nine or 12 or something like that, all the old software would still work. It would just work a lot faster. Um, so this is sort of a... The weird thing about this is a lot of people still talk about these as though there's the the CISC versus RISC argument and all that. Uh, realistically, everything on the outside, it'll look like a CISC or RISC architecture or an EPIC or VLIW. Internally, though, uh, just because of the reality of how to make software fast, things tend to run probably kind of like a VLIW processor from, if you think about them conceptually, what they're doing. The difference is, on something like VLIW or EPIC, all the transistors are just executing based on the assumption that the compiler knew what it was doing. So they don't actually have to think about the instructions, they just run them. So this is really fast. And also doesn't use much power. Whereas something like an x86, which still looks CISC from the outside, it's going to have to translate these instructions into some sort of internal representation of the, the meaning of the program. And it can run those in parallel, but that means it's actually it's effectively having a compiler written into the hardware in front of the instruction unit. Um, this, it slows things down, it makes things hotter, it makes you need more and more transistors just to do something you could have done once in software. Um, so it's kind of unfortunate that that's kind of where we've all ended up, where x86s are used in almost everything because they really don't expose what the hardware actually can do and how it does it. Um, these other, these later variants, they, they were able to do that. Um, but we all use x86 largely because of instruction compatibility. We didn't want to recompile all the software. We just wanted it to work. So um, that's that's kind of where things went. But there are still there are still examples of those other ones being used. Like I said, RISC architecture that's used on ARM, and everyone's probably got an ARM chip in their pocket on their their you know their Android phone or their iPhone or something like that. Those all run those architectures. Um, similarly even though the Itanium never made it into the mainstream home consumer market, it's still pretty common in things like high performance computing and high range servers. So these things still exist and it's kind of interesting that the, it never really ended. Uh, just, it's just an issue of can you benefit from those in those environments. Anyway, uh, I hope that this is one that seems interesting or at least clarifies some of what these ideas mean and where they came from and where they're going um, because it's something that I always found really fascinating. Um, but anyway, if there's any questions or comments, uh, post a comment here or send me an email and I'll get back to you. Thanks.